cars back out on the circuit now as they come out of the garage area in preparation for our 30-minute co-driver session. There are three sessions on the program today in preparation for the Vodafone Gold Coast 600. We've got six races remaining in our championship, 900 points available, 19 points between first and second in the championship. An ultra-important session this one and this weekend because our normal drivers, of which there are 26, the field doubles out to 52 in preparation for these endurance races. Remembering this is also the final round of the Pertec Enduro Cup. And then we have the run towards the back end of the championship season. Big moment inside the garage there. Ryan Walkinshaw at Walkinshaw and Ready United. And the band live will be playing live. James Courtney there as well together with Scotty Pye. It's a big weekend. Remember, it's a combination of great entertainment. It's a great party, a great show, great music and great supercar racing. And they're going to be playing tomorrow night with Foreigner. So, uh, Mark Scaife, going into this session, if you're a co-driver now, it's your opportunity to learn and understand this track. Run us through in great detail this wild ride. It is a wild ride. Good afternoon, Neil. 2.96 kilometres is the tour around the streets of the Gold Coast, and it is punishing. It's hard on cars. It's difficult to negotiate your way around this concrete canyon because the slightest mistake bites hard. The average speed is about 155 kilometers an hour, 265k down the main straight. And for about half the lap, you're on 100% throttle. This little lazy kink through the right-hander, past the pits to break it into turn one, through this complex of one, two, and three, and then up to the best passing spot on the whole of the place, turn four. It's effectively a really tight hairpin, turns back on itself, and then this run along this beautiful coastline of surface paradise up to the fast beach chicane. We saw some dramas there with lots of great images through the course of practice one and the big moment right here at turn nine and 10 for young James Golding who made contact with the fence on the right hand side and then pinballed himself across to the left hand side. Then down to this very tricky braking area into Breaker Street and then this is a section that's pretty much traditional street circuit, 90 degrees, lots of different cambers, lots of crowning on the road, manhole covers, painted lines, different surfaces. And this tricky little entry to the straight where the road falls away from you at 14, then turns back into a tight double apex at 15, leading onto the main straight. And as I said, these beautiful images, Neil. If you think about racing anywhere, and you look at the way that this place unfolds, the atmosphere and the beautiful beachside location, it's as good as it gets in our circus. And about 25 degrees out there at the moment and a great shot looking down towards the south as we pick up now our co-drivers and I was about to make the point before the track map came up, Mark, about the importance and the responsibility that lies on the shoulders of these drivers. This is Earl Bamber who last weekend was at Road America, I uh, Road Atlanta, I beg your pardon, for the Petit Le Mans sports car race. And he's driving with Shane Van Gisbergen. It's his debut weekend. Now, he's having a run in the Porsches as well. We're actually clobbered the tyres this morning. They're trying to get him kilometres at this racetrack. So he's a genuine rookie here. This is the reigning world endurance champion. And how about this guy, Alex Premer, who's won here on a couple of occasions previously, once with Shane Van Gisbergen, and again on Sunday last year. So he's driving with Scott McLaughlin. They're just 19 points behind now in the championship and got on the podium again at Bathurst a couple of weeks ago. Another impressive drive. We get great shots around this concrete canyon. Beautiful beachside images. High-rise buildings all around. 26 co-drivers out there now for a 30-minute session. And Paul Dumbrell's also had a couple of wins at this location. He's sharing with Jamie Wincup. And remember, they had a very difficult Bathurst, but they were incredibly quick at Sandown. So the Pertec Enduro Cup winds up after this weekend. And it's a 60-point spread between... Lowndes and Richards and Van Gisbergen and Bamber. So it's a championship within. We've got the battle for the Virgin Australia Supercars Championship and all that matters around that. And then we've got this other little championship that will conclude this weekend. So there's several things to keep an eye on. There is. And, and as you said, the pressure on the co-drivers, especially for Shane Van Gisbergen with Earl Bamber and Scott McLaughlin with Alex Premer, is intense. 19 points separate the two league competitors. What about this man, Stephen Richards? He was able to win his fifth Bathurst with his highly esteemed colleague, Craig Lowndes, who won his seventh. But as you said before, Neil, the co-driver pressure and the way that these guys are going about it, it's a, a 
weird racetrack because you couldn't get two venues more dissimilar. Big, fast, open Bathurst where the cars perform incredibly across the top of the hill especially. But around here, it's, as you said, lined with concrete walls. And this is Luke Yulton who would have been sitting there in agony watching his teammate Dave Reynolds who was highly fatigued and cramped up at the end of the Bathurst race. And for Luke, it probably is a, a weekend that got away. They were the fastest car through the course of the weekend and probably, in terms of pace, deserved the victory. It was pain for him here last year as well because last year they came to the venue as the reigning Bathurst champions. And then on the Sunday, he was involved in a little shunt. Luke Gilden, so that, that put pay to the campaign. It is the highs and lows of the game, and you could not get more in the way of polar opposites between Mount Panorama and the Surface Paradise Street Circuit. This is heading in a northerly direction up Main Beach Parade across this wild chicane, the Virgin Australia chicane that leads you up to turn 11 for the blind left-handed 90 degree second gear corner into Breaker Street. It is a passing opportunity, but the inside of the road is dirty. The camber is the wrong way and feeds you into the fence. <laughs> and just to add a little bit of insult in the whole process, there's a heap of white lines there. So if there's any moisture, dirt, rubber, debris, anything, the universe conspires in to try to draw you into the concrete up there. So time and again, everybody's done it in the game that's worn a helmet. You know what? There's a decent gap up here. I'll have a lunch. What could possibly go wrong? You say as the bits go flailing past your ears. <laughs> And the road runs out. The road runs out. <laughs> David Reynolds is watching. It's a weird sight when you're a primary driver in these cars and you have to sit there and watch your race car go by. We've covered off in great detail the agony of his weekend at Mount Panorama. If there's an upside, if you have a bad weekend at any race venue, particularly at that one, it's amplified if you've got no pace and nothing to brag about. They led 112 laps of the great race two weeks ago. They got a lot to brag about. They didn't close the deal, but that car was brilliantly quick and both drivers were too in virtually every condition, the semi-wet, the wet, the dry, and everything in between. They did a mighty job. Car number 99 was impressive as well. And Anton Di Pasquale, unfortunately, didn't get the result that he and Will Brown probably deserved. They end up with damage later in the day. Their start in the early phase was impressive certainly was they were the standouts as you said through the course of that weekend combined between uh, Anton and Will they had no supercars experience there zero <laughs> crazy <laughs> this is Gary Jacobson in car number 15 I went down there they were very strong in the first session in the hands of Rick Kelly he was the fastest guy asked he and George Commons the engineer if they're going to change anything on the car and he said no and how do you feel after Bathurst and he said well a bit tired, but I'm a bit doughy. I just had a mini hamburger and now I feel sleepy. That was the sum extent of Rick's debrief. I was hoping to get a couple of pages of notes about springs, anti-roll bars, brake bias, aero, rate, bump control. All I got was mini hamburgers. He does like a burger, the boy, doesn't he? He does. And he doesn't show it. No, he doesn't. Right in behind him at the moment is car number 23, the industrial athlete entry of Dean Fiore. He's partnered up with Michael Caruso. They've been an item for a long time. Ryan story. I just noticed all the cars lined up for the session at the start there. Small delay on the 17 coming out of the garage. Any concerns with that car? No, just making changes with it and uh, getting it ready to uh, take on the session. We'll do a race run in this uh, in this particular session and get uh, both Alex and Tony familiar with the cars. But you know what engineers are like. They'll uh, they'll always take up every uh, every every moment of time that they can, thinking about what to change with the car and how to make it better. And if there's three hours five minutes, they'll use three hours and seven, won't they? Absolutely. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Andy. Cheers. David Rills looking on Luke Hewlett. The timing screen out there, mate. Uh, how was it after, obviously, everything that's gone on the last few weeks, getting back into a race car here at the Gold Coast this morning? Hey, it was really good. Um, it's good to get back in the race car and forget about what happened at Bathurst and uh, drive this track. It's a nuts track, isn't it? It's just so much hard work, so much stress, and I love it. Um, just physically uh, on the Monday after that race, forgetting obviously the, the emotional side of it, but also physically, how were you on Monday? I mean, we, you looked pretty obviously drained on Sunday night, but how were you Monday morning? Yeah, man, uh, I struggled to walk properly for about five or six days. Uh, it's like I ran a marathon. I've never tried to run a marathon before. That's how bad my legs were. But otherwise, mate, I was all right. Just a bit emotionally depressed after the whole thing. And what about uh, in the lead up to this one, mate? What have you done maybe differently or di or at all to prepare for what's going to be a tough couple of 300k races? Yeah, exactly. Um, so this week they're really kind to me and we haven't done a lot of appearances. It's been great. 
Thanks, Bob. Thanks, man. Chaz Mostert, now you've been listening on to the commentary for this entire session. Can you give us a, just your synopsis on how well the boys have been doing? Uh, all I know is, I don't know if there's commentary coming through this, but your Shania Twain mix is awesome. <laughs> That's it. Don't give away my trade secrets, but you did say that Neil was having an outstanding call. I didn't hear a word you said. I don't know how you actually do this job. This is fantastic. All I know is I heard Neil uh, about five minutes ago, and I tell you what, that guy's voice, it's... It's so beautiful. It sends shivers down my spine. I tell you what, I can't wait to go home and retire and just listen to you guys. Chaz, your helmet's too tight. I suggest going up a size. It's taking oxygen from your brain. <laughs> this is the one time that you can actually hear the response of the commentators. Yeah, yeah it is. I actually prefer this because it um, feels like we can, um, you know, you guys can sledge us like two minutes before you talk to us and then we're like, all best buddies, we think, but we know now. We know now with this iPod. Hey, we Rihanna, know all the secrets. Rihanna, you're in the <laughs> no secrets. You're in the fashion game. What do you think about Chaz's new haircut? I quite like it. We, we actually spoke about this before we're coming on camera, and I, I think it's I think it's very handsome. Oh, thank you. I think that we've, okay. we're standing awfully close to each other. <laughs> It's cooking down here in Super Cheap Auto. <laughs> Thanks for your time, After Jess. that uh, riveting exchange, we'll go back to the racetrack where we can see, unfortunately, a massive problem here for Will Brown. We'll get back to Chaz Mossett. I wanted to talk to him about the adventure in the US last weekend, if we ever got onto anything serious. But things don't look good down here for 99. That's young Will uh, in the car at the moment, coming up with a diagnosis. And I know what the answer to that is. It doesn't look good. That's right. Look what the glove block is on fire. The left-hand side of it's got... Heaps of smoke coming out. I didn't actually really know at that point, but it looks like a power steer fire or a... Yeah, actually, now I can't pick up on it because when it turns left, it was much worse. So inside the cabin, that would have been really bad. So good call by Will to pull it up. Yep, there he is. So that's just on the pit entry side of the main straight. And as you can see there, there's the remnants of the smoke. Young Will's doing a bit of his own Neil Crompton mechanical work. <laughs> Don't loop me into it. <laughs> so uh, I thought his drive at Bathurst was impressive, and again, it was a shame that they ultimately didn't get the result that they probably deserved from a pace standpoint. It was a great start to proceedings. He's another of the rookies here this weekend. It's a whole new deal for him. No exposure in the Virgin Australia Supercars Championship to this racetrack. 12th at Sandown, on target for a decent result with this man on screen at Bathurst. Ultimately, they were classified as having finished in 24th position. We're inside the garage down there at Penrite and Erebus at the moment. So they'll get that car back in. Now, at least it's close to the pit lane, so they don't have too far to be able to migrate the car to get in there and have a look and understand what's going on. This is uh, shades of Doug Shivers at Bathurst pushing an XU1. <laughs> just the modern version. Might be a bit different. Just a little bit. It's not uphill. Plus the other 17 people Blake's helping. helping. He's got a bit of extra horsepower yeah, in the no process. Kelly. That'll help. <laughs> he's a good young yeah. bloke, this Will Brown. We really like him. He's, uh, he's got a, a great attitude to racing. And what a combo, those two young guys. Anton, who qualified that car superbly. And then through the course of the race, they were uh, very competitive. Jump in, Will, is the instruction. Unlike most drivers, he actually did it as he was told. There's the in-car camera. We've got those cameras in every car. And you can still see that smoke that we spoke of when he pulled up at pit entry. Murph? Uh, yeah, actually, there's a bit of a confusion, isn't there, mate? Um, Anton Deep is quietly. We don't actually know from what's going on here at the moment. The engine was still running. Everything else actually looked all right. Must be some sort of leak potentially onto the exhaust. Uh, yeah, something like that. Like I said, we've got no idea at the moment. Um, I especially have no idea. Uh, you just see on the footage. At first, I thought it was just a bit of tie rub or something, but then it actually looked like it happened through a straight line. So, um, obviously, something's leaked or let go, but we'll find out once we get the car back, which is now, and uh, have a look. Hopefully, it's nothing too bad and it's all good for the other. Hey, uh, you uh, had a few exciting moments out there in uh, practice one. We had a couple of slow mos of the, the 99 uh, sideways across some curbs. Uh, How did you find that first session, and what, are you, what were you trying to tune for this one? Um, yeah, it's quite hard. Both myself and Will have never been around here in a, in a car other than a, a little former car like four or five years ago. So track time is sort of what we need. Um, which, so this is a bit of a setback, but um, yeah, just getting getting my head around it. There's not much track time this weekend, so before the racing, so just trying to get as much as we can, which is uh, not that good at the moment. Thanks, bud. Hey, Murph, Scapey, 
Hey, um, Neil, the motorsport reporter, just put his head out the commentary box window and he just he reported back that there's mm. definitely a problem with that car. Yeah, there is. And there, I saw smoke. <laughs> Lots of smoke. Lots of smoke. Well, I, I appreciate the input because I, I, I missed all that. Yeah, yeah. I've done a PhD well done. Thank in you. race car smoke and there was a lot of it. <laughs> We're getting, getting on with this session once again. I've exchanged texts with Mostert to sort out on the back channel the communication. He'll uh, no doubt contribute to the telecast again a little bit later on. They did a good job at Bathurst, didn't they? And he and James Moffat came home in fourth place. There is kind of a five on screen now. And uh, double duty again this weekend for James. Paul Dumbrell's the fastest on the 12 flat, so he's done what he's done every time this year so far. He's jumped onto the racetrack, opened his account strongly and made an emphatic statement about his pace. He did it at Sandown, he did it at Bathurst. Lost the lead in the Dunlop Super 2. Interesting to see how that plays out. But he's been an evergreen performer as a co-driver and in that series now for a long period of time. And interesting to contemplate what he may or may not do next year. His business career is flourishing. He's a very busy man whether he continues to have time for his professional motorsport. But right now, his focus is trying to contribute to making sure that he brings home a really large fistful of points this weekend for Jamie Winkup, as will the guy on screen here at the moment, James Moffat. Where are they sitting at the moment? They get a representative time going 13th at the moment for James. He's done a 12-4. Pretty good time, actually, for Dumbrell with limited running there. 12 dead straight up. 11-3 was the fastest from the previous session and they were putting fresh tyres on at the end of that session. So impressive initial speed and as you said every time he's jumped in the car this year that's what he's been able to demonstrate. Dumbrell, Russell, Jones as in McCauley, Luff, Yielded, Webb, Tremor, Russell as David, Tony Delberto, Jack Perkins, that's the current 10. And that is separated, the top 10 is separated by 0.4 of a second. Of the co-drivers out there that are the other half of the championship contenders, in terms of the leader, Earl Bamba, it's his debut. For Prema, he's had two wins here, they're second. For Dumbrell, with Wind Cup, two wins. For Richards, with Lowndes, one win. And for Yulton, with Reynolds, a runner-up position with P2. So four of the five drivers in the top five in the championship have all proven that they can score here, which will, of course, have been taken into account when they're chosen for their roles in the first instance, their ability to adapt to these racetracks. Car number 12 just sat up for quite a long time over the curbing that time in the hands of Tony Delberto. I spoke to Garth Pander before about what happened with car number 34 in the hands of James Golding a little bit earlier. And that's one of the issues they've got going with those Wilson security cars at the moment. They're flying too high and too long. And it's a bit of a trait here. You have to tune your way out of it with the way in which you get the suspension to work on the car. So in the case of 33 and 34, they're looking for more drive out of the cars, but trying to settle them down from flying over these curbs. It make, makes great entertaining television pictures for us. But when you're engineering a race car, it's not always necessarily the fastest way around. So there are varying ways in which they try and control that. This also illustrates quite clearly for us all the different contours, shapes. I mean, have a look what you're dealing with. First of all, the run into turn one isn't straight. So therefore, there's all the black lines of the lockup. Waves in the road. Here it is from the other angle. Big bump at the 100 metre mark. Together with the surface changes, plus the curving on the left, plus the painted lines. Then there's another curve on the right and another on the left. And just in behind it, in case you don't have enough risk involved, there's a concrete wall. <laughs> you make it sound very hard. Yeah. It is. <laughs> But that's right, they arrived there at 265 k and you've got about 150 metres to retard the car slow enough. That's a great shot of the angle and the complexity. And then what Neil was saying, you've got to get the car slowed for the left-hand piece, but really the tightest section is where the It's Live in Queensland sign is at Turn 2. So the whole way right now, you're braking, 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 off the brake. So the slowest point is the right hand piece and then if you're a little bit fast you make contact with the concrete on the left hand side at turn three tenth at bathurst a correction tenth at sandown fourth at bathurst for james moffat making the northbound run as we go back inside the garage this time down at Erebus as they get on to what the story is. Gregory? Yeah, just a quick update there, believe. They just fired the car back up and did a bit of a steering uh, movement and uh, oil was coming out of the rack. So it's blowing a seal or something, I think, in there, boys. 
not so good. I don't think they're going to get this car back out for the, uh, any more oh, in this session. Troubled up at turn 11. And unfortunately for Gary Jacobson, it's buried deep in the tyre yeah, wall there. So thanks for the update, get a go, get a Greg go. Murphy. Yeah. And right, so Gary's been able to grab reverse. We've got red flag now, red flag. So Jason Bright taking evasive action. He'd gone up the run-up as well. He managed to get All around right, it. I just got really distracted. So here's the replay. Whoops, he's gone straight ahead. So he's gone straight ahead afterwards. So distracted on the radio is what we just heard him talking about, and he's driven it straight in. Oh, that won't uh, debrief well. That won't debrief well. And it's actually hit very hard. See how far the rear wheels were off the ground when it made contact. So he went straight ahead. So this will be the debrief that you were just talking about. That distressed Rick well, Kelly. The frustration there is they started from practice one with perfection. Position number one, car was balanced. Rick was actually joking about how nicely it rolled out of the truck. And then this is the kind of setback then that changes the tone of the weekend. And that's a frustration. And particularly is he gone straight through the chicane, has effectively aborted that lap. You really you should have slowed up and come in that's effectively what you would normally do so by aborting the last part of the chicane and effectively destroying the lap you don't need then to make a mistake like that so gary will be kicking himself the team will be saying what's the issue here we go so we're on board now so this is the first part of the chicane and then he aborts the last part because he wasn't going to make the left hand at turn 10 and then just runs in here have a listen Pulled so much lock on there at the end. I, I was surprised. What's this? I wonder how much caster it's got too on the at front. So there's Rick. Yeah, and the problem on that corner is once you're out of the ideal race line there, there is absolutely nothing you can do grip-wise. So on the outside of the race line there, it's dusty and dirty, there's rubber. And you can see the car had no grip, just bounced straight into the wall. He actually dragged a bucket of lock, didn't he? He had a lot of lock on there at the end, trying to get it to turn left. But at that point, it's got so much understeer and the road's so dirty that uh, the end result was, as you saw... Okay, so they're just uh, the universal symbol of it's not good. Um, they're going to have to park that car up now and do a fair bit of work to resurrected in preparation for the third session later on today. In the meantime, this is inside the garage at Erebus. We were briefly up at the other end there as well. So Cunnaber 99 has just been backed into the garage now. Anton Di Pasquale on the right-hand side there. And that will hurt Will Brown's experience around here too. It takes him out of the, the co-driver-only session, doesn't it? So, and, and obviously Gary Jacobson there out of the car, parked up. So this is also a little window on what's to come, bearing in mind we've got two 300-kilometre races this weekend where the co-drivers play a significant role. It's what we started the session talking about, the contribution to the championship. So any little slip-up around here, you know, we talk about Bathurst being high-speed, high-risk, very different rhythm and style of racetrack, this one, but there are several places at Bathurst where you can make a mistake and largely get away with it. Not all, but some. But here, it's almost impossible to get away with anything. There's a couple of spots where you can run straight ahead. But any time that you arrive awkwardly over a curb or you try and rush at turn 11, as an example, which swallows cars year on year, you're pretty much always going to end up with damage. And you've probably got to be more at one with a higher level of confidence in the car here than almost anywhere. Gary, there was an unfortunate incident in the co-driver session. Mate, you yeah. said on the radio that you were distracted by the radio comms. Yeah. What, what was that all about? Yeah, I just made a bit of a mistake. I got too busy talking during the um, the in-lap that I was on. Um, I made a bit of a mistake. That's uh, my fault that I crashed the car. No one else did that. That was on me. So you live and you learn, mate. You've got to bounce back. We've got another, you know, couple of sessions to go before the race tomorrow. So move on. Looks like that's you done for this session. They're going to spin the car around. Yeah, All the best for the rest of the weekend. Back. Sorry, I don't want you to get hit by the car. <laughs> Guess that's it for today. Thanks, mate. That's a real shame. So uh, that car, I imagine, will be out again for the latter session today. Practice three, which is for all drivers. Jonathan Webb's done an 11.7 out there in car number 19. That's a good time in the Techno Autosports truck assist entry. This is Earl Bamba, followed by Paul Dumbrell. 
followed by Jonathan Webb in the background on the run up to turn 11. You can see the inconsistencies in the line, the cambering away of the racetrack there, the lines that I spoke about, and the concrete ready to swallow the car if you make a mistake. It's the same when you come down here in Sericia Street as well because it's extremely bumpy through that section of 12 and 13. So if you find that as a result of the bumps, you lock a brake and run slightly wide there, the grip goes from not too bad to catastrophically average very quickly. In fact, we've had nose to tail incidents there in various categories, including with the supercars in years gone by where everything just comes to a grinding halt. Jack LeBrock on the right-hand side of screen there, sitting in 18th in the championship. Been an impressive run for him, so his rookie championship year with Campbell Little in the background, Adrian Burgess in the foreground. It's been a very strong one. He's driven very well, hasn't he, all, all year? And that was Aaron Russell, who had a little moment there at the same spot. Don't really know how close that was. Didn't really quite pick up on whether he had the wheel locked for a long time and almost had a Gary Jacobson moment or it was just a little run wide. He did a really good job at Sandbound in that very tricky race on slick tyres in the rain. That was for race for the grid one in our armour or qualifying system. And that was for the young Newcastle lad. A very good result and a nice mature drive. He actually driven well through the course of the Pertec Enduro Cup. He's the fastest of the Nissans at the moment. Aaron is currently sitting in fifth, and he's three tenths of a second away. There's his primary driver, Andre Heimgartner, on the right hand side of the screen. So, Webb, Dumbrell, Moffat, Dalberto, Aaron Russell, Luff, Paul Jones, Steve Owen, Luke Gilden, Jack Perkins, Alex Premer is 11th, and Earl Bamber is 19th. On the strength of his drive here last year for Heimgartner, if you recall, he stepped in and covered for, at the time, it was the hurt Ash Walsh. He couldn't drive at Brad Jones Racing, so Andre drove with Tim Slade in the Freightliner car. And on the wet Saturday here, his drive was supremely impressive, and that contributed massively to him gaining a full-time ride in 2018. So this place probably shone a real light on his capabilities, Andre Heimgartner. Stephen Richards on screen here, car number triple eight for Autobahn, five times a Bathurst winner. And uh, just an incredible run again two weeks ago for him. What's been an amazing career. He's a very, very strong endurance driver. And they had great pace. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't come to you by accident up at Mount Panorama. So the drive that he and Craig put together up there was mighty impressive. And he's also been busy like some of the other drivers. He was racing in New Zealand last weekend. So, uh, plenty of kilometres in the recent past. Dumbrell, Webb, Moffat. Current margin uh, is a whopping two one hundredths of a second covering the first uh, couple of cars. And there's Lowndes, who's barely touched down in the last couple of weeks with all of the commitments off the back end. Love that great victory. Seven times a victor now at Mount Panorama in the great race. And that adds to an already rich story for him. Certainly does. So Dumbrell with that 11.72, just slightly ahead of Jonathan Webb with an 11.76, and then James Moffat with an 11.79. So three different teams, all separated by the massive margin of 0.07 of a second. And McCauley's looking very quick at the moment. This is the reason why we picked up this car. New livery again this weekend, the Alliance colours on car number eight. They were in Repco colours when we were at Bathurst last time out. So McCall is currently yeah, sitting in at that, And that was Andrew Edwards on the radio in the background, the engineer for that car. And he's gone P1 on an 11.5. That's a pretty handy number. 11.32 was the fastest in the first session. So that's only just on two tenths of a second away. Oh, that was close. Oh, was it All just the mirror? Well, it was going to be worse than that if he didn't correct it and slow up. Brad Jones, dad looking on. But that was a close moment. He had a little, he's got a smile going because he knows how close that was. That's a, that's a nervous smile, that one. Here we go. So he got the inside curb too hard. And then when he ran wide, you see he pulls a positive lock on. He's dragged lock on the car. You can't make the car really turn at that point because the car's A, flying and B, understeering. 
and then he's just grabbed the mirror but that was going to be a, a quite a severe hit if it didn't it literally is the mirror it is it's the, plucked the mirror the, out yeah. yeah the casings largely stayed there but the mirror itself is flying over and going to drop in someone's letterbox as a gift from brad jones racing <laughs> and uh, no doubt bradley will write that's an invoice a, to his son for that few, one that's a few <laughs> that was that was the lip reading but he got away with it. Dalberto, meantime, has actually gone slightly faster than McCauley with an 11.51. So these guys are very impressive given they're not in the cars all the time. This is a real test of commitment and car control around the streets of the Gold Coast. There's also an X factor around here, isn't there? And you were talking about it earlier in the day with Russell. Uh, some of it is set up. And there's clearly always some science involved in the sport. But there is a tiny little bit of driver madness in this as well. It's how brave do you want to be? What can you get away with? What can you innately contribute to the lap time around here? There is often a fair chunk of that in a good lap time around here. And the drivers that have got that innate skill to be able to pull it together on a street circuit generally do it on repeat. And yep. they do it over uh, their career. Some great images. In fact, that one that we saw of Macca, Macaulay Jones, before, if you look very carefully just at the point where it was about to land, it was actually only on one wheel yeah. so it had the inside completely off the deck together with the left rear so it's essentially going in there like a unicycle <laughs> yeah. the left head prop wasn't accepting the load uh, this is these oh, i love this shot i don't think in australian racing we see the cars stand on two wheels as high and that was a big moment for aaron russell it's parked itself right up on the curb and then in the mad world that we live in we talk about the level of grip that you've got and on the you can see there with the orange light and the windscreen it's the super soft tire this weekend and on that tire over that curb with that amount of grip the cars stand right up on two wheels and it's an exhilarating feeling especially if you can make it go from one side to the other side through the lefts and the rights it's a uh, very unique section of road had a glimpse in the garage there a moment ago the racing of steve owen in the rabble car currently sitting in 12th cast your mind back 365 days and he was a winner here on the Saturday with Chas Mostert. He hadn't had a run in the car when I caught up with him earlier but he was performing barista duties making himself a fine coffee. Was he? He was. Did he make one for you? No he didn't. Oh, did he offer? No he didn't so <laughs> we probably should stop talking about him. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we catch up with Earl Bamber now who oh that was a nasty little understeer there at the right hander that's turn 13 and Thank very you. easy box so he's coming in but that was a nasty understeer easy to grab the fence as champion gisberger looks on so coming in now for bamba bamba currently is 19th that was his best lap up to there he's done a 12 6. so even at that there's one second separating the top 18 cars 11.51 for Dalberto. Now that 11.51, that would have put him seventh in the earlier main driver session. So that's pretty impressive based on 11.32 being the fastest earlier on. Five minutes remaining now in this session. Dalberto and Jones are in the pit lane. Dumbrell is active on the track with Prema Moffat. It's the top six cars. Warren Luff on screen. And you can see the armor all predictor showing us about where he's going to drop in here. This is home event for Warren. His Bathurst record continues to be ultra impressive on the podium again two weeks ago. He said to me last night, five of the last seven have resulted in hardware off the back of it. So that's a great performance. So nice work on his part. His day job when he isn't racing and he actually does quite a bit of it is not too far from here stunt driver at Movie World so those skills are put to very good use on this racetrack. I was going to say it's almost like a hundred percent stunt driving around here isn't it? So Dumbrell's on a good lap that may improve his pace. Alex Premer which uh, you recorded a second ago he's in fifth so at the moment Dalberto in the Ford from Macaulay Jones, Paul Dumbrell, Jonathan Webb, three Holdens and then two Falcons with Alex Premer, James Moffat, and Stevie Richards, Aaron Russell's the first of the Nissans in eighth, and Dubbrell does go up with 11 4 2. So that's only one tenth of a second away from the fastest lap in the earlier session. 
And he's proving again that he's got main driver pace, which means that team's got total flexibility in how they manage their drivers. That's a huge strategic advantage. And there's James Golding on the tools, making sure that he can contribute to the fix for the car that unfortunately he was driving. It was damaged and uh, was even on the spanners. I, I went down there and there were a lot of them on the floor before when I was down there. That's a very big job. So uh, everybody pitching in at Wilson Security Racing, great to see. And it's always appreciated by the engineering and mechanical group when the driver actually pitches in rather than disappearing to a motorhome or into a debrief area. It's a, it's a team business and it makes a big, big difference when somebody helps. Check out this. All four. Here all we four? go. Let's count. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah we go. Four. four, four. Bingo. <laughs> Aaron Russell. <laughs> like it when they fly. So we, um, I, I reckon I saw fresh air under three of them before. Now we've got a four. We've got a four. So nice work, Aaron Russell. There's absolutely no pace in it, but it keeps us amused in the commentary box in practice. So the guys down here at Nissan Motorsport, they're ripping into the 15. We saw Gary Jacobson make contact with the title. I did get clearance from Nissan. They gave us some really good access. You can see this front Rio bar here has absorbed that impact on the right front. There is a bit of damage to the front chassis rail as well. Now, this is all designed to break and crumple in here, absorb some of the front bar impact, comes back through here, bends that, that gets taken off, bolted back on for quick repairing. Also, that chassis rail is going to get repaired as well. But the most important thing is that if you look at that front carbon piece there, all of those bits that I just pointed out that have, have absorbed the impact have saved damage to the engine and that air box. So that's pretty important for repairability. Thanks for the update, Andrew, but a uh, real shame. And it just changes the rhythm of the race weekend. So a little bit of frustration, unfortunately, for everybody involved at Castrol Racing. Car number 14 is on screen here, that's Ash Walsh. He's sitting currently in 17th. And we saw him straight line the chicane there, so the timing reflects that. Aaron Russell, meantime, is on a very good lap, so his personal best in sectors one and two means that he's actually the quickest on track at the moment and on target to potentially go to the top. So if that's better than 11.4, that's right on the money. There's more cloud cover now than there was earlier on. The temperature's about the same. It has got a little bit cloudier. There's still the threat of a shower. Wow, level one, two. There you go. So that's actually the quickest time of the day. So nice work. It might make a liar of me. Three sets of greens, maybe. It could be to do with the tyres. Have a look at Reynolds here. What's that? What's he doing there now? <laughs> He's cooling himself, Mark. Ah. Will that help his fatigue? No? No. Because <laughs> he's doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> but it's Reynolds. He's yeah. Got, it's a... he's yeah. an interesting lad, isn't he? He's so, doing a bit of wind tunnel testing down there at Erebus. Um, when you reported about green tyres earlier today, We've got the Dunlop report here that they've got three sets of green tyres for car seven. So that may have assisted Aaron with that lap time on 11 one two, but that's a three-tenth gap to Paul Dombrell. And prior to that, there was basically 20 cars within a second. So it's going to be very close. Uh, Earl Bamba is on his best first sector. So maybe they put some tyres on that car to give him a bit more confidence. He's currently down in 22nd. Alex Prema, where's Prema? Uh, he's currently 10th on 11.78. What is evident though, and I know it's practice and this is the experimentation time mark, but if you look at the list of drivers, we're looking at 25 out there at the moment, knowing that Gary Jacobson is parked, I would suggest that the best part of 80% of the field has either just gone straight through a chicane or curb hopped. That all has to be managed on the weekend because they can't do that in the race. So that is the function of practice, to understand what you can and can't get away with. Yeah. But that'll need a big tidy up because at the moment it's all lit up like a Christmas tree. Yeah, it's exactly right. There's more green and yellow than there's anything else. Earl Bamba now, 11-4-1. I said that they'd probably put some tyres on. May not have done that. So that may, from a, a speed perspective, improve their capability and confidence this is a hard racetrack probably in terms of the challenge for Earl so far it's the most difficult one of the three races that he's done that's not Macaulay Jones in there that's David Reynolds they've just done a driver change so Luke Gilbert's jumped out Davey's jumped in 
and that rehearsal all the time. And at the e end of every session, you'll see drivers <laughs> doing that. And then Davey walks away and goes, that was a waste of time. <laughs> Not a bad thing to rehearse because if you roll your thoughts back a year ago, remember they had the drama getting in and out of the car on the Saturday and they had to do it via the window. So Alistair McVane in there together with his drivers, Luke Yulden and David Reynolds, making sure that they're properly prepared. Jason Bush is the engineer on the left-hand side. So car number seven has ended up being the fastest driver and he's climbing out of the Nissan Altima and he's actually come home with a really hefty number. So 0.29 of a second faster than Earl Bamber. That's a very impressive number. In fact, it is the fastest supercar time we've seen so far this weekend. Just reiterating that, 11-1 plays 11-4. You can see it on the screen. So Earl Bamber, nice work. Paul Dumbrell third. Tony Dalbodo, Steve Owen's done another great job out there from Warren Luff, Macaulay Jones, Jack Perkins, Stephen Richards and Jonathan Webb. And then second in the championship at the moment, Alex Premer, who did a longer run. They want to see what the trend looks like with that car in 11th position from Luke Yulden, who we saw doing pit stop practice with uh, David, followed by James Moffat, Fiore Bright, Pitha Wood, Rulo Walsh, Jacobson, Russell, Canto, Brown. They had a problem with car 99, Davison, and then Bryce Fullwood, knowing that Gary Jacobson spent the majority of the session in the lane. Aaron Russell, sorry to interrupt you there. Uh, quickest time of the day. Co-drivers don't get much, so you made the most of it with that one. Yeah, it wasn't an easy session either. We had a brake drama midway through. The, the pedal went to the floor at turn one, so that was a bit scary, but the team just did an awesome job, and it just feels good to drive a good car around here. You know, It just feels so hooked up, and I feel so comfortable in the car as well. You certainly do look relaxed. What was the tyre quality that you had on the car there? Um, I think it was all right. Obviously, it wasn't green, but you know, I think it had Andre done a couple of runs on it, so it was all right. Um, but that's probably the best tyres I've driven on for a while now. You know, the old co-driver life. You don't get too many good tyres, so you've got to make the good opportunities. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. PD, thanks for the access, mate. I know you guys are debriefing. P3, strong start. Your day is done now. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, I don't have to come back until about 3 o'clock uh, Saturday afternoon. I was about to say Sunday. It might be a bit of trouble. Uh, uh, but no, the car's been really good. Obviously, Jamie was uh, quick earlier on, so he ran some old tyres there, a bit of race car stuff. So um, overall, the car's pretty good. The good thing for me there is you say you ran old tyres. We just heard from Aaron Russell, who ended up quickest. He was on a second set, so, you know, it looks like you guys are pretty strong. Car confident on those curbs? Yeah, the car's good. Yeah, we're probably a little bit weak on the curbs at the moment. We're good everywhere else except the back chicane. So I think there's also a little bit in driver. Getting a bit old these days and probably don't take too many risks. Saw James Golding give the uh, wall a kiss uh, earlier on today, so don't want to do that, that's for sure. Sometimes it's the better option. Thanks, PD. Thank you. Cheers. And Macaulay Jones, you gave us uh, one of the highlights for that practice session, uh, getting nice and close to the wall out there after jumping the curb at Turn 1. Car feel pretty good? Yeah, it's, uh, it does feel pretty good. I love driving around here. It's such a challenge, but it's very rewarding. But, yeah, definitely got close to one of the walls out there, as I'm sure a few other people are as well. It's, it's kind of the nature of the track. What do, you, what do you love about this place? Coming from somewhere like Bathurst, we, we're very, very different uh, racetracks, you know, a couple of weeks apart. What do you like about this one? Yeah, it's definitely a different track, that's for sure. It's, uh, you couldn't really get any two contrasting uh, tracks. But I just really like the hustle around here. You know, you, you get a big reward out of um, really committing. So it's, uh, it's very, very fun to drive around. Pretty comfortable at the moment in the car? Yeah, definitely. We're, I think we've got a pretty good setup going so far, and, and I'm sure we'll tweak it. And, and you know, it's, it's about staying on top of the track here. It, it, it evolves so much over the weekend that it's pretty key to, to stay on top of it. And that's it for you for the day? 